Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our book launch this evening. Um, I'm very, very pleased that we're all together to celebrate the launch of Monica Yoon's first UK collection, From From. Um, my name is Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press, and I'm sure most of you know how this uh, works already, but I'm just going to run over some uh, sort of housekeeping for you before we get going properly. So, um, as I said, this is Monica's first collection in the UK. It's actually her fourth collection overall. Um, we are the UK and Commonwealth publishers, excluding Canada. So if you're in Canada or the States, please go to Grey Wolf because they're publishing the book over there. Um, Monica was actually published in Karkinet's New Poetries Anthology number no. two back in 1999. So um, very cool that um, she's back on the Karkinet list now. Uh, we're also joined by Sarah Howe, who um, I will introduce properly in a second. She's here, she's going to chat with Monica, um, and she can field some questions from you guys later on, if you have them to put to her. Um, so this evening, um, the event will last about an hour. Um, I can see some of you have found the chat box. Please do find the chat box, say hello. Uh, we like to hear from you. We want to know where you are in the world, what you think of the reading, um, just stuff like that. Um, if you have any technical problems during the event, pop them in there and I'll do my best to help you. Um, during the poetry reading itself, I will be screen sharing the text um, just for a bit of a visual guide for you, but you can reconfigure the screen if you have other needs. So just have a play around um, and see if you can like recalibrate it if you need to. Um, thank you very much for paying your two pounds to be here. We really, really appreciate it. Um, you will get two pounds off the book if you're in those territories where we pub publish this edition. Um, I'll pop the code in the chat for you. Um, and we can do all this later again as well, and then email will come tomorrow, blah, blah, blah. Okay, there, the bare bones of information that we need, the exciting stuff. We're joined by Sarah Howe, um, who is a Hong Kong-born British poet. She's also a, an academic and an editor. Um, hopefully you've heard of her first collection, which was Loop of Jade, and it came out from Chateau and Windus in 2015. So if you don't know her work, go and check it out. Um, but I'm very pleased she's here. And I will now invite her to join me on screen so that we can get started. Um, thank you so much, Jazz, and good evening, everyone. I'm really delighted to welcome you all to the UK launch of um, Monica Yoon's new collection, From From, um, which, as Jazz mentioned, is her first to be published on this side of the Atlantic and will surely help make her extraordinary oeuvre even better known here. Monica divides her time between Brooklyn and Southern California, where she is an associate professor of English at UC Irvine. Her many prizes and honors are too numerous to list now, but include the Levinson Prize from the Poetry Foundation, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and the William Carlos Williams Award of the Poetry Society of America. I first got to know Monica's work via her third collection, Black Acre, published by Grey Wolf in 2016, which confirmed to me that this was a poet whose new work I would always want to seek out immediately. Black Acre seamlessly melded an almost forensic inquiry into property and personhood, and I use that metaphor advisedly since she trained and practiced for years as a constitutional lawyer, with poems that capture the ache of struggling to conceive a child, it was preceded by Barter, 2003, and Ignatz, 2010, uh, the latter named for a cartoon mouse who makes a cameo reappearance in From From. The daughter of Korean immigrants, Monica grew up in Houston, Texas, a place where, she once recalled, racism was as pervasive and as exhausting as the humidity. A nimbly fictionalized version of that girlhood to early womanhood features in one section of From From, alongside other strands that reflect, refract embodied experiences like race or motherhood, among others, through modes as various as mythological reimagining, riddling parable, and lyric essay. From From's title alludes to and makes strange that perennial question come microaggression, but where are you from from? that insidiously brands its object as a perpetual foreigner. You will hear tonight from the book's coruscatingly brilliant meditations, sometimes head on, more often at an intriguing slant on race, racism, and the Asian American situation. These are poems haunted by injustices past and present, but that also begin tentatively to claim a more celebratory sense of a shared identity. We're in for such a treat tonight. Let me hand you over to Monica Yoon. 
Thank you so much uh, to Sarah, to Jasmine, to Michael, and to everyone at Carcanet. Um, having lived in the UK for a couple of years, it is, um, and really thinking of it as a place in which I came into my own as a poet. Uh, my first publication ever was in PN Review. Um, you know, it's so wonderful to uh, to uh, to be with Carcanet, uh, especially here. Um, and um, and thank you, Sarah, for that brilliant introduction. Um, and uh, I will try my best to do justice to it in this reading. Um, I wanted to start with a poem that I think thinks about Asianness more broadly in the context of classical Greek myth, which is the whole section of the book. Uh, part of the um, part of the idea of the book is to think about deracination, to think about what it means to be, in some sense, uprooted, uh, to not to have that core sense of authenticity that one would hope would ground one in a sense of belonging, of home, of homeland. Um, and, you know, growing up in the South, um, I found that a lot of my sense of what Asianness was was uh, generated by other people, by non-Asian people. And um, and I try to trace that back through uh, Greek myth. Um, and so much of Greek myth is interested in this question of what is Greek and defining it against Asianness, uh, the Trojans, the royal family of Thebes, the um, the family of witches who are the daughters of the sun, Circe, Medea, Pasiphae, um, and then um, and then uh, of course the figure of Marcius, uh, who comes from Phrygia, which is in modern day Turkey, uh, and Marcius um, is a satyr, um, and he rather famously um, um, he rather famously uh, challenges the god of music, Apollo, to a musical duel. What had happened was Marcius had been strolling along and finds a set of pipes that had been discarded by the goddess Athena. He picks up the pipes. Uh, he thinks he sounds wonderful on them. And uh, he proceeds to challenge Apollo. And Apollo wins the contest, but in punishment has Marcius uh, flayed alive and his, um, and his hide hung on a tree. Um, and to see this not as an example of hubris, um, as it's usually told, but to see this as a story that's infused with coloniality which is what it means to emulate and compete with your supposed betters, uh, brings an entirely different, but I think a more original slant uh, to the story. Um, and Marcius later becomes a figure of, um, of speaking truth to power uh, in the Roman Republic. Marcius after. Dust loves me now along with leaflets, plastic bags, anything unattached, anything looking for somewhere to stop, something to emblazon. Too painful to brush them off the day's adhesions, too much a reenactment. I float in my tub of blood warm water, element of indecision, if only it could be my habitat, if only the sawtoothed air didn't insist on its own uninterrupted necessity. I hate it, but lacking skin, I've lost my capacity for scorn. That was my failing, not excess of pride, but that stooping to pick up their accoutrements as if emulation could engender equality. I stain everything I touch. It all stains me. My raw surface is an unlidded eye, each stimulus its own white hot knife, but why would I submit to be resheathed, to lessen pain? What used to distinguish me is already defeated, limp trophy flag of conquest. Now I could be like them if I chose, but the acidulated rain imposes a least common denominator, democracy. It scours away the pigments they used to humanize their marmorial self-regard. 
their eyes gone dull as the calluses I would suffer forever rather than become. Um, and then next, um, I had a few parables in the book uh, about magpies. I'm sort of fascinated by the figure of the magpie. Uh, the magpie in most Eastern traditions is a very positive symbol, a sort of bringer of hope and often a symbol of the underdog standing up for um, the rights of the proletariat. Um, and, um, and magpie in Korean um, is Hachi, and then um, together is gachi, so it sounds a lot like the word together, and the magpie is, in fact, the national symbol of Korea. Um, but in most Western traditions, um, the magpie is considered to be a thief or a hoarder um, at best, and at worst, uh, something that preys on and possibly kills cattle. None of these myths have... Um, have uh, have any scientific basis, but still uh, they have been responsible for the mass slaughter of magpies, particularly in the United States uh, and in the UK where the trap I describe uh, is still uh, legally used. Parable of the magpie in the trap. A certain magpie was caught in a wire mesh trap and the trap was small and the magpie could not fly, neither could it stretch out its black wings. And the trap held no food, nor did it hold water. And the magpie was hungry and thirsty in the shadow of the sun. And then the hunter came and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no food for you, and my meat is stringy and foul in the mouth. But the hunter put food and water for the magpie in the trap, then the hunter went away. And then the cold rains came and the wind and the magpie huddled in the trap and the magpie could not dry its feathers nor was there any dry place for the magpie to rest its feet. And the hunter returned and the magpie said, hunter, you should release me from this trap for you cannot sell my feathers for my black feathers are not beautiful and neither are they proof against the wind and rain. But the hunter placed a stick in the trap as a perch for the magpie and placed a roof on the trap to shelter the magpie. And then the hunter went away. And the trap was on the ground, and the coming night was near, and the predators began to wake in the shadow of the woods, and therefore the magpie was afraid. And the hunter returned, and the magpie said, Hunter, you should release me from this trap, for I am no threat to you, nor do I prey upon your beasts, nor do I feed upon your gardens or your crops. But the hunter placed a larger trap around the smaller trap and turned to go away. And the magpie cried, hunter, you must release me from this trap for no animal preys on me. So therefore I am not bait for any quarry you might wish to trap and kill. Now the hunter spoke and said, magpie, others will not come for you to eat you. Others will come for you to attack you and to drive you from their lands. For no now, magpie, that you are not bait because you are wanted, but you are bait because you are hated. And it is because you are hated that therefore you are valuable to me. And the magpie cried and said, Hunter, what quarry is it that you take such pains to trap and kill? And the hunter said, Magpies. And then the hunter went away. Parable of the Magpies in the West. And the magpies flew west and came to a land where there were many flocks and herds that were ill-tended and diseased. And the magpies said to each other, indeed, this is the place we have been seeking and here we will make our home. For here there is food for us, consuming the vermin that so torment these animals and open raw wounds in their tormented flesh. And this will be our work and the service that we offer to the Westerners and therefore they will welcome us and reward us richly. And the magpies tended to the herds and therefore the magpies found their work and raised their children and other magpies came to join them. And the Westerners watched the magpies and at first the Westerners were glad in their coming for the care that the magpies gave to those among them so long uncared for. And therefore the magpies walked proudly among them and the magpies had neat black coats and neat white shirts, 
and the magpies nodded their neat black heads and called to each other with loud voices. And then some Westerners hated the magpies and said to the others, see how the dark hands and dark mouths of the magpies are ever wet with the blood of their work and their food. Surely, therefore, these magpies are unclean in their ways, and therefore we should not suffer them among us. And then a sickness came upon the land, and many died among the Westerners and also among the magpies, and those who were sick were cared for by the magpies. And still some Westerners hated the magpies and said to the others, Surely the sickness came to our lands with the coming of the magpies, and surely, therefore, the magpies have brought this sickness to our lands through the uncleanness of their food and the uncleanness of their ways. And then some Westerners hunted the magpies. And some of the magpies cried out and said, Why do you hunt us? Are we not those who care for you even in this sickness? But other magpies answered them and said, but has it not always been so, you who have chosen to care for those who are not your own? Um, and I'll end with a final poem, but it's um, it's rather long and it um, and it uh, takes a little bit of explanation. Um, it is based on a historical person, uh, the 18th century Korean prince, uh, Prince Sado. He was the crown prince of Korea. Um, the heir to the throne, and he marries an amazing woman named Lady Hyegyong, uh, and they have a child uh, who is referred to as the grand heir. And then Sato seems to go homicidally insane, and he rapes and kills probably about a hundred courtiers. And because Sato is a member of the royal family, um, his person is sacrosanct, and even the king, his father, um, is really quite constrained in what he can do about this situation. Because if he condemns Sato to death or declares him insane or even sends him into exile, then the grand heir, the grandson, will also be stricken from the line of succession and the country will be plunged into civil war. And so what the king does. Um, is on a hot July day in Seoul um, at the palace. He asks for a rice chest to be uh, brought before him. Um, and he asks Sato uh, to come and tells Sato to apologize, which Sato does. And then he asks Sato to get into the rice chest. A rice chest is a box. It's just what it sounds like. It's about, uh, a meter by a meter and a, you know, probably about a little more than a meter um, cube. Um, and Sado gets into the rice chest and um, the rice chest is closed somewhat later. It's bound with rope, grass um, is heaped on top of it for some reason. And about eight days later, Sado dies. Um, and this is a detail study because um, I had written the opening poem of the book uh, also mentions the rice chest. Uh, but sometimes, just like you see in a museum, you'll have a detail of a painting. Uh, this is a detailed study of that earlier poem. So just really focusing in on the rice chest, detail of the rice chest. In the 2015 Korean film, The Throne, the rice chest sits in the center of the vast symmetrical courtyard of Changgyunggung Palace. The film is called The Throne in English. In Korean, it is called Sado. A Korean speaking audience would be presumed to know in advance who Prince Sado was. An English speaking audience is presumed not to have this knowledge. Although this is a historical film for a Korean speaking audience, the well-known story functions as mythology at the level of symbol. For an English speaking audience, the unknown story functions as narrative at the level of plot. There is an I in this poem. I know who Prince Sado is. I can read the Hangul word Sado, but I do not speak Korean. I am a member of the English-speaking audience. 
I know about Primsado from the memoirs of Lady Hyegyong, 1805, but I know about the memoirs of Lady Hyegyong from Margaret Drabble's The Red Queen, 2004. Margaret Drabble's The Red Queen is about Lady Hyegyong, but Lady Hyegyong was never a queen, nor is she associated with the color red. The name is misleading. The name of the film, The Throne, is also misleading. The film does not focus on the throne. It focuses on the rice chest. Like a magnifying glass, the stone courtyard focuses the gaze on the rice chest. The gaze increases in intensity and heat. July temperatures in Seoul average 84 degrees Fahrenheit with average humidity of 78%. I have been to Seoul in July. I have worn hanbok on a summer day, but only once. I have never seen a rice chest. The rice chest is a functional object and stands in contrast to the highly decorative architecture of the palace courtyard. Its plainness renders it inscrutable, impenetrable. Because of its oversized lid, the rice chest appears top heavy, charged with kinetic potential. On its four small feet, it seems to be crouching on its haunches to be hunkering down. Hunker down is a Scottish term that refers to squatting on the balls of one's feet, low to the ground, but in readiness. It implies an apprehensive stasis, tense with the potential for sudden movement, poised to flee or to attack. I have hunkered down, but only once. Midway through the film, the rice chest is bound with thick rope, with a knotted webbing of four or five thicknesses of coarse fibrous rope. The quantity of rope exceeds the function of the rope to such an extent that the rope binding seems decorative, symbolic. I have been bound with rope, but only once. There is something almost comic about such an excess of rope to bind a single imprisoned and dying man, the way there is something almost comic about a circle of guns pointed at a single unarmed man. I say almost comic rather than actually comic, because although these images provoke the same pent up tension as suppressed laughter, I do not know who would find either of these images funny. After it is bound, the lid of the rice chest is heaped with grass. For a Korean speaking audience, the grass covered rice chest would resemble a traditional grassy burial mound, would evoke ancestral tombs or even the prehistoric dolmens, which feature massive rocks perched on four small feet. I have seen the grassy burial mounds of my ancestors, but only once. For me, the rope-clad grass-covered rice chest resembles a barbarian idol. According to the online etymology dictionary, the word barbarian comes originally from the Greek, meaning any non-Greek, and carries a derogatory connotation, those who speak a language different from one's own. When I say barbarian, it means I find the rice chest foreign, inscrutable, although it is Korean. Koreans speak a language different from my own. In the film, the walls of the rice chest are made of thick planks with chinks between them that admit slim shafts of light drips of water. But the walls of Korean rice chests are made of solid panels of wood. Planks with chinks between them would admit pests, especially insects, into the rice chest. Such a rice chest design would not be functional. Partway through the film, we see a multi-legged insect enter the rice chest through a chink between the boards. The single insect is followed by a horde of identical multi-legged insects wriggling through the chinks in the walls. We understand the insects to be a hallucination of the dying Prince Sado. Their function is symbolic, the danger of allowing chinks in the walls. In the film, through the chinks in the walls, Prince Sado is able to see and to speak to his dog and to his 10-year-old son, the Grand Heir. But in fact, these incidents never took place. They are not hallucinations, but fabrications of filmmakers, just as the multi-legged insects, the chinks in the walls of the rice chest are fabrications of the filmmakers. The chinks allow the gaze to penetrate what would otherwise be impenetrable, to penetrate the inscrutable barbaric figure of the rice chest, to reach the human inside. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is familiar to both Korean and English speaking audiences, Tom Snout, a rude mechanical, plays the part of a wall that features a crannied hole or chink. The joke is that a human being portrays an inhuman object, since only an inhuman object would feature such a chink. 
I do not know who would find this joke funny. When asked to show me thy chink, Tom Snout holds up two fingers. I have seen boys hold up two fingers. Calling me a chink, they would place their two fingers at the corners of their eyes, stretching their eyes into narrow slits through which it must have been difficult to see. They found this joke funny. I have seen men hold up two fingers. They would use their tongues to penetrate the chink between their fingers, rendering the gesture obscene. The tongue thrust between the fingers reads as sexual, whereas an outthrust tongue without the fingers would be merely rude. Neither gesture is intended to be funny. Both the boys and the men would use their two fingers to symbolize my body, a body that without a chink might seem impenetrable. The primary meaning of the English word chink is a split or crack, a narrow fissure or valley. Chink also has a racially derogatory meaning, referring to a Chinese person or by extension to any East Asian person, since an English speaking person using a racially derogatory term would not be expected to differentiate among East Asian people. I have asked boys to differentiate among East Asian people. Upon being called a chink, I would say, you're so stupid. I'm not a chink, I'm a gook. The Korean American comedian Margaret Cho later used a similar statement as a punchline to a joke. I find this joke funny and some members of a Korean speaking audience might find this joke funny. I do not know whether other members of an English speaking audience would find this joke funny. The term gook was used by English speaking soldiers to refer to Korean people during the Korean War. It was later used by English speaking soldiers to refer to Vietnamese people during the Vietnam War, since English speaking soldiers do not differentiate among East Asian people. The term guk may derive from the Korean word for American, miguk. Hearing Korean people say this word, English speaking soldiers thought the Korean people were calling themselves guk, mi guk, and followed suit. The word miguk in Korean literally means beautiful country. Miguk is a transliteration of the Chinese characters miguo, which also mean beautiful country. I know how to pronounce miguk, but not miguo. There are several accounts of why miguo came to mean American. Some claim it's a simple phonetic approximation. Others claim that miguo was selected out of several possible phonetic approximations by 19th century American missionaries and then made official in the 1901 Boxer Protocol after China's defeat by eight foreign nations. I do not know which account is true. All commentators seem to agree that neither Korean people nor Chinese people literally believe that America is a beautiful country. But both Korean people and Chinese people must call America beautiful in order to speak its name. Neither Korean people nor Chinese people refer to themselves as gooks or chinks. Neither Korean people nor Chinese people refer to themselves as Korean or Chinese. Korea is an English word, which seems to derive from a mispronunciation of the name of the Koryo dynasty by Silk Road traders and was first recorded by Marco Polo. China is an English word, which seems to derive from a mispronunciation of the name of the Xin dynasty by Silk Road tra traders and was first recorded by Marco Polo. I have said Marco Polo's name many times in a game that requires you to say his name many times. I do not know the origin of the game. Because of the R's and L's, Marco Polo would be a difficult name for Korean speakers to say, but I am not a Korean speaker. I have called myself a gook many times. I have called myself a chink only once when a white high school friend used the term in conversation, then stopped, realizing her gaffe. Don't worry, I said. I know what you mean. X is such an FOB. What's an FOB? She asked. Fresh off the boat, I said. I may be a chink, but at least I'm not an FOB. We laughed together to relieve the tension, although I do not think either of us found my joke funny. I used the term FOB to show that I considered X to be foreign, a barbarian. I called myself a chink to make myself seem more American. Fresh Off the Boat was my white husband's favorite television show during the time we were married. 
When we watched it, I hoped that laughing at the pushy Chinese immigrant mother on the show would lessen his dislike of my pushy Korean immigrant mother. I hope that allowing my white husband to treat my parents as endearingly foreign, fresh off the boat like the endearingly foreign TV family of fresh off the boat, would make myself seem more American. None of the actors in Fresh Off the Boat are fresh off the boat. Nearly all of them were born in America. By pretending to be foreign, they make English speaking audiences feel more American. My parents are not fresh off the boat. They have been in America for more than 50 years. They speak both Korean and English. A television is a box that allows us to put people inside it. The television is sometimes called an idiot box from the Greek for private person, from idios, meaning one's own. But those inside the box have no privacy. We put the inscrutable into a box so they may be scrutinized. I made X inscrutable, I put X into the box. I made my parents inscrutable, I put my parents into the box. I decorated the box so it seemed foreign, barbaric. I made the box inscrutable so it seemed like a distant ancestor. I buried it so it seemed like a grave. I made a chink in the box that the gaze could penetrate. I stayed outside the box. I treated what was inside the box as a joke. I was the English speaking audience. I watched fresh off the boat on the idiot box. I watched the throne on the idiot box. In the throne, a parent puts his son in the rice chest. After the son's death, the rice chest is forced open. After the son's death, his mouth is forced open. Three spoonfuls of rice are forced into his mouth, rice that might have kept him from starving to death in the rice chest. After the son's death, a name is forced into his mouth. The name is Sado, a name which has meaning for Korean-speaking audiences. I have said Sado's name many times. The son never called himself Sado. There was never a chink in the rice chest. No one could see into the rice chest. There is a you in this poem. You are a member of the English speaking audience. I let you see into the box, into what is private, into what is foreign, into what is inscrutable, into what has been buried. I am the chink in the box. Thank you. Uh, Monica, thank you so much for that wonderful, powerful reading, um, which ends, of course, on the final line of the entire book, uh, which just blows the whole thing wide open again, doesn't it? What a catastrophic and amazing ending. Um, Loop back to the the first poem that you you read, um, many of your revisionings of Greek myth in this collection work as double portraits. So Orpheus, Eurydice, Echo Narcissus in your study of two figures series. Um, but Marcius here stands or, or floats alone. And he also gets a monologue while most of the others are observed in a third person of varying closeness. I, I found myself wondering How did you arrive at this uniquely haunting voice for him? Um, I think, you know, Marcius is someone perhaps that I identified with more strongly than I did the other figures in the book. So it made a little more sense to put him as a as a single persona. Um, And also, you know, if I were to put him into a duality, it would have to be with someone like Apollo. And Apollo is so dramatically inert, right? He's just kind of, you know, cold and perfect and um, and sort of awful um, and, you know, serves as a sort of epitome of Greekness and is only sort of interesting when you put him in contrast with with someone like Dionysus, who's referred to as the Asian god uh, through, um, throughout Eur- Euripides' the Bacchae, for instance. Um, so, um, yeah, and but this sort of doubling is something I was quite interested in because I'm interested in the way that race affects the dynamics among people, uh, the way in which it affects conversations, relationships. Um, 
you know, it, you know, most of these relationships are not binary, um, and um, there are ones in which the uh, the characters are working at sort of angles to each other, and I'm interested in those angles and those deflections and reflections. Mm, wonderful. Um, I should have said uh, that audience members, uh, there will be a chance for you to ask your own questions at the end. So please feel free as Monica and I chat to start to um, pop your questions into the Q&A section on the bar at the bottom. Um, Monica, your work has always been formally very various. Um, and that ranges on full show in From From Two. So we get everything from the sort of sonic mutations of the deracination sequence to prose that ranges from biblical periods to quasi philosophical propositions. Um, what role did form play in the process of bringing this collection together? Yes, I mean, form is always paramount for me because until a poem has form it's just an idea right I mean form is the body of the poem but um, I've, I've started thinking about this lately and I think the way in which I think about form is very functional like I think of form as like a building a building that embodies an idea and then you're trying to, in some sense, build a building that has a function. An amphitheater is going to look very different from a home or an apartment or a train station. Um, and, you know, and so my forms will look different. And in each one, the reader is entering into it and experiencing it in a different way. So just depending on often how I want the poem to be oriented with respect to the reader, uh, the form will change fairly drastically but I'm always usually I have the idea for the poem years before I ever come up with how I'm going to formally embody that um uh my mind is sort of blown by the antithetical symbol of cultural mutual misunderstanding which is the magpie um I never sort of uh known um about the East Asian significance of the magpie to my shame. Um, so when I read that in the notes section to From From, I, I, yeah, I couldn't believe the aptness of it and wasn't surprised that you'd latched onto this emblem. Um, but I wondered why the magpie poems became parables. So there's something of the moral teaching to them and the beast fable maybe, but there's something very Old Testament about them too, not least in their cadences. Is there something of the origin story of racism as a sort of original sin, an American original sin? Um, I don't know if I was thinking of it in terms of sin. You know, the magpie poems, I had been trying to write magpie poems for this book since at least 2017 and had not nailed the tone until I came upon, you know, until I thought, wait a second, these are poems that are trying to be didactic. Um, and I'm interested, uh, they're narrative poems that are didactic, they are parables. And so, you know, and I was trying to mimic in some way the cadence and syntax of the King James Version. Um, and so I was looking at those uh, for, uh, for models, but, um, and it just gave me more room to be explicitly didactic and to have each one sort of end with the sort of lesson um, than I otherwise would usually allow myself. Um, and I thought that that, um, that that sort of made sense because they are very public facing poems. Um, they are not poems in which I am personally implicated. You know, they're, they're figures for age, you know, the Asian immigrant in general, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um... One of the poems in Blackacre that really stayed with me was the Goldacre poem that reflects on the figure of the Twinkie, um, which for those of you who don't know it at home, Twinkies are of course that iconic American processed cake finger thing, um, which uh, are also, it seems, um, uh, a racialized slur, a bit like banana for the inauthentic person of East Asian descent who's um, white on the inside and yellow only on the outside. Um, I sort of, in, with hindsight, feel like that poem for me points forward 
two pieces in this book, like Detail of the Rice Chest, the last poem that you read tonight. Is it fair um, to see that, that poem as a sort of extension and re-exploration of that Twinkie, that sweet myth of a lost wholeness, as, as Goldacre put it? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Goldacre was one of the absolute last poems I wrote for Blackacre. And it was one in which I started to think about these questions of inauthenticity, inauthenticity and deracination. And the poem was, I think, written maybe in 2015, perhaps that late. And you were beginning to think of, we were, you were seeing the rise of white nationalism in the United States, you know, the nostalgia, that weird, you know, what is the function of the again in Make America Great Again, that sort of weird weaponization of nostalgia um, and this idea that there used to be a sort of racial harmony. So I had actually written that poem. That was a good formal uh, poem because the poem has this column of as ifs and then this column of uh, statements that largely appear to be in the past tense but the as if shifts them into the subjunctive so the way in which the grammar of the poem works is you know in the subjunctive which is the way we talk about unreality um, you are becomes as if you were um, so there's this mixing of unreality and pastness uh, in our construction of the subjunctive. And so I was kind of playing around with that idea, like what is past and what is a re-seeing of, you know, what is a, you know, a nostalgic mythologizing of what is past. And then, you know, and thinking about that creation of myth-making, which is often nationalized. Um, is what sort of led me directly into the first poems for uh, this book, which are um, the first poems I wrote for this book, which were was the Greek myth section called Asia Minor. Could you say a bit more about the book uh, as reflecting on um, nation and nationalism? Um, I, I suppose maybe these are questions that come more acutely to the fore even when thinking about the book reaching its international audience as it is tonight? I think one of the things that I had been thinking quite a bit about in the past few years was this question of uh, what is nationalism, um, nationalism versus patriotism. You know, one definition that I've heard, which is rather famous is, uh, you know, patriotism is love of, you know, one's own and nationalism might be hatred of others. Um, and where the line there is drawn, which is a question that, you know, you're facing urgently in Britain, that people are facing urgently all over the world, and that we're facing here. And how do you keep this sense of community um, and homeness from becoming, again, weaponized, toxic, um, you know, bristling with, you know, how do you keep that sense from becoming a border wall? Um, and so that was something I was thinking quite, quite a bit about, uh, particularly during the pandemic, where I think Asian identity was sort of weaponized against East Asians, uh, you know, where I was living in Brooklyn, it actively did feel as if you were being hunted, you couldn't go outside of your house without people yelling at you and you know just you know it was it it was really nerve-wracking I've lived in New York City for 20 years I have never felt unsafe until then um I think uh Monica I could uh ask you things all night long but we have some wonderful questions appearing in the Q&A box so I should probably give others a chance to um have their turn too um everyone if your appetite has been whetted by this chat, um, there's a longer conversation between Monica and I uh, forthcoming in a future issue of the Poetry Review, so you can always see more there. Um, Monica, a question from Fred Degas. Uh, um, he says, thank you for a riveting reading of your haunting poems. I loved the simplicity and circularity of your deepening thinking process, sonic and mesmerizing and unsettling too. 
Could you say a bit about the space that you clear in your poetry after the catastrophe of the magpie poems and the prints in the box? It, um, is that space raceless, free of hate, spiritual? You know, I don't know that it's possible to have a completely raceless space, um, at least not in our minds as we have constituted them through our contemporary consciousness. Like, you know, it would be lovely to be able in some way to, uh, well, you know, actually, I don't know if it would be lovely to write, uh, to wipe the space clean. What's necessary is not the elimination of race, but the appreciation of difference right? Uh, what it means to actively love those who are not like you and to not to have to see similarity as being the only, uh, as being a precondition for affinity or for love. Um, and, you know, what that world uh, would look like, what that consciousness would look like. But I wish that I were the person doing that work and I can't claim to be. Um on a completely different tack, Mary Mulholland um, is interested in your own poetic journey. Um, so who or what got you into poetry? I mean, maybe one of those figures is here tonight in the form of Michael Schmidt. Um, yes, absolutely, <laughs> uh, absolutely. And uh, Michael remembers my uh, dear friend, Stephanie Burt, who I think uh, they are still in touch. But um, but I think that the uh, the first poem you know I asked my students often what is the, what were you reading when you had this click and you said um I have to do this and mine was reading Archaic Torso of Apollo uh, Rilke's uh, in Edward Snow's translation which I think is um the best translation of those poems um and uh just thinking okay, I have to be able to do this. The way in which the sort of, um, you know, that's of course the poem in which, you know, the, uh, the gaze is almost spiraling around this torso and you can, all, the distance to the torso is almost palpable. You feel like, you know, you were within, you know, uh, you know, you're very, very close up to it. And then suddenly the camera pulls back and swivels onto the reader and says like, you must change your life famously. Um, and I was just thrilled by the way in which, I don't know, in retrospect, the way in which that the, um, the vividness of that perspective in that poem. Um, and then, you know, I've, I, um, I was never somebody who was comfortable writing autobiographically. I don't think I wrote an autobiographical poem until uh, until I was in my early 20s and I was a creative writing uh, uh, minor in college. So I did quite a bit of writing before that, but, um, but never in the first person. Um, a couple of questions from Hannah Crawforth. Um, I might loop back to the second if there's time, but um, first, Hannah wants to pick up on um, what you were saying about origin stories. Um, so uh, how the idea of origins played into this collection. She says there are so many different origin stories here, myths, parables, etymologies, and they are so often revealed to be both artificial and also profoundly significant. I mean, it's interesting to think about like, what is the significance of an origin story? What does it matter? Uh, we're here now. Uh, and what is the attachment that we have to origin stories, uh, to this idea of authenticity? And I don't think that I consciously was looking to debunk them. I think that I was looking to just, I guess, just kind of dig down to the very root of them. Uh, deracination, of course, is uprooted. Um, and perhaps to do that sort of uprooting work, to think, okay, well, if we're going to think about the term Asia, which is itself a Greek word, uh, which kind of referred to those people over there where we have colonies, um, what does that mean for our contemporary sense of what Asianness is in the Western imagination? Um, uh, and Michael um, uh, Schmidt, uh, confirming uh, how well the poems work outside the United States. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, he asks, in the writing, Monica, were you deliberately writing away from the American specifics? 
I think I was not writing away from the American, but I was writing, I think, toward a more general sense of East and West, uh, which of course would uh, incorporate uh, Europe. And since I'm writing in the English language uh, and, you know, and grew up in, uh, in the English language tradition um, of literature, um, that was, you know, where I was thinking of the dividing point. Um, you know, there are events and histories in America that are relevant to the book, particularly immigration histories, but a lot of those are paralleled uh, in the United Kingdom. I seem to have frozen. Sarah, we've just lost Sarah briefly there. Um, we do have some more questions. I'm just going to jump in and I'm going to read um, another one of these questions for you um, okay. until Sarah returns. Um, so there's, we've got one here um, in the chat from Jessica. Um, she says, in your Tin House interview, you talk about your evolving use of pronouns, progressing from first third to first person. Was there an element of suggested protective disassociation because trauma through the initial preponderance of distanced pronouns? Yes. I mean, I think that there is a sense of disassociation. I, you know, I has I do not apply the term trauma to myself. I have not had a traumatic uh life. I'm I'm blessed in that way. And I know many people who have. Um, and so I don't want to claim the mantle of their experience. Um, and I think that relates to my initial positioning of pronouns in the book. Like it was important for me at the out at the beginning to say, look, I'm not the hero of this story, uh, nor am I the victim of these stories. I'm someone who knows about these stories and is interested in them. And so, um, you know, the first person very rarely appears in the poems in which I wrote, which I wrote first in this book. Uh, and um, even the supposedly autobiographical poems uh, that were loosely based on my upbringing are written in the third person, uh, but they're often quite fictionalized. Um, but then as I got more and more into the book, I started to think, well, I think the ethics of that anonymous positionality are questionable. Like, I always feel like when you're writing about race, privilege of various kinds, disadvantage history, it's important to give a sense of your own, you know, where you stand, uh, what your positionality is, um, and in what way you are coming to this question so that the reader can assess that for themselves. And so I kind of forced myself to be more present um, in the um, in the later poems in the book in a way that was quite uncomfortable for me, but seemed uh, seemed necessary to the project of the book. I'm so sorry, uh, my computer managed to have a catastrophic crash there. <laughs> so um, I, uh, I, Jazz, did you ask um, the, Jessica's question from the from the chat. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, I'm afraid I can no longer see uh, the um, questions. But but uh, Monica, did Jazz have a chance to put Hannah Crawford's second question to you, which I think was um, asking about how you managed to thread all the different aspects of um, detail of the rice chest together. Sure. Um, I mean, I didn't get the exact question, but I can certainly answer that. Um, I didn't know all of the elements. I, I I literally started detail of the rice chest with just that first line, you know, here's a rice chest just sitting in the middle of the palace courtyard. Um, and, um, and I've been trying to write these poems without really knowing where they were will go. Uh, so, but uh, starting with sort of the material of tone. And so it's a sort of rigid tone in that. And it's like, I think of it like building a stair step. I know how to build a stair step and then I can build another step on top of that step. And then I can build another step on top of that step. And I don't necessarily know where the step will end. Um, and often it ends up doubling back on itself and becoming recursive in this way that ends up being sort of structurally poetic. Uh, which 
I, I, and I watched that process happen. Like I had no idea my parents were going to come into that. I had no idea fresh off the boat was kind of come into it. Um, Margaret Cho, uh, you know, the etymology, you know, various etymologies, you know, the etymologies would usually come in because I would be stranded on this step and say, Hey, I'm on this step. What is here? Well, let's look at the material of this step. Well, there's a word in it. Let's analyze that. Okay. Well, that's taking us somewhere else. Uh, but also structurally, I was very influenced by stand-up comedy and in mm. particular, a podcast that the comedian Hannah Gadsby, uh, I think who's Australian, um, had given and the way in which stand-up comedy, imagine an hour-long comedy set is quite hard to structure. And while I was living in the UK, I was actually dating a stand-up or, or an improv comedian who was working with Eddie Izzard at the time. So I spent all of my weekends at the comedy store watching um, watching comedy and, um, and appreciating it as an art form. So, um, and the way in which it'll just start to loop back and those loops will sort of accumulate um, toward the end of the set, uh, was sort of the model for some of the longer poems in From From. Um, I'm so glad you said that, Monica. I think we've uh, had the chance to chat before about um, humour in the book more generally, um, but uh, the sort of comedic um, deadpan punchline like structure of that poem is, is so fascinating, as is its tone more generally. Um, that repeated phrase stuck with me in, from your reading, almost comic, almost comic. Um, that the, 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 the humour, comedy is countenanced, but sort of rejected amidst the horror of that moment as, as grotesque. Um, tell, tell me more about um, uh, humour and, and irony uh, there. Irony feels like it's just around the corner and yet is that, is that acceptable? Yes, I mean, I think that humor and irony are both forms of distancing, uh, which is a way, you know, and my gaze, I'm told, is often very clinical, like my way of dealing with things that are painful is to just pin them down and analyze them, to, and, you know, dissect them to death. Uh, and humor is very much part of that. And, you know, humor also becomes a coping mechanism, like how is it we're going to, you know, what's just going to get us through this day? All right, well, there is a funny side to it, actually. Uh, and, you know, and let's look to that. Um, you know, humor is also like intensely concerned with language and the precise use of language. Um, and so, you know, all of that kind of comes into, uh, you know, just working with the material. If there's something funny on the step, then let's mention that. Um, what I had written on uh, on my, on a sticky, on my, computer when I was writing detail of the rice chest was just the, in all caps the word show your work like if something was is occurring to you just bring it in see what happens um I got a cheeky bonus question in there at the end um thank you so much Monica for this uh it's it's been a gift actually this this reading and conversation tonight um and thank you audience members for such brilliant questions um yeah and thank you, Jazz, um, and everyone at Carcanet for um, hosting such a wonderful launch event. Um, look, uh, everyone, look out for live readings um, from Monica in the UK in the autumn uh, in places from uh, Manchester to London and many others, I hope. Thank you. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you both so much. Um... This hour just flew by, gosh, I wish it had been longer. Um, thank you guys as well for your comments in the chat and your questions and everything. Um, I am gonna pop again the link and the discount code for you in the chat. Um, please do buy yourself a copy of the book, buy one for all of your friends, uh, unless you're in the US or Canada, in which case buy it from Grey Wolf. Um, and I suppose the last thing for me to say is please join us next time. Our next event is um, a week today. We're launching a, a book by Leslie Harrison, which is called Kitchen Music, 7pm um, as usual, and that is in the chat for you as well. So um, that's everything. Um, I'll leave the chat open for a couple of minutes so you can get your last minute messages in there. But um, yeah, thank you guys again and congratulations, Monica. Um, this was a real pleasure. <laughs>